Hello, everyone. I'm Avi Savar, president of Suzy. I am delighted to welcome you to Research Unleashed. Last week, we were fortunate enough to get together for an incredible in-person event. I had the chance to share some exciting product updates, and we hosted a number of industry leaders to discuss current trends and disruptions in market research. This included a keynote from PNG's Diane Cheshire and a panel discussion hosted by our very own Katie Gross and featuring Amy Heron from City and Arsh Guman from Mars Wrigley. It was an incredible day of content and I'm thrilled to share highlights of that event with you today. Immediately following those sessions, we're gonna host a live Q&A exclusively for all our virtual attendees. So please stick around, enjoy. And today we're talking about Research Unleashed. What does that actually mean? We're gonna go through a program uh, with some incredible speakers. Uh, I'm gonna share some highlights of some upcoming product releases. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about kind of where the world is today as it relates to research. Um, Diane Cheshire is gonna follow uh, my presentation and give a keynote on um, product innovation trends. She spent a better part of her career pioneering that at Procter & Gamble, and she's gonna share some insights with us today. She also happens to be a member of our advisory board, so we're very grateful for her uh, participation and her uh, partnership with Susie. Um, after Diane, Katie Gross is gonna host a panel discussion uh, with Amy Heron and Arsh Guman, who's also on our advisory board and very grateful for her participation. Uh, and they're gonna talk about disruption in market research uh, and what they're seeing in and around the landscape. Because let's face it, the world is kind of a funny place at the moment. Um, whether you are a product innovator, whether you're a marketer, or whether you're an insights professional, the world of understanding consumers has drastically changed. Um, and we believe that the way you conduct research has to change and evolve alongside it. And that human understanding really is the greatest competitive advantage a marketer, an innovator, a researcher can have in order to maintain uh, category leadership, in order to maintain products that consumers want, like, share, talk about, even in a downturn. Um, over the last few months, we've been working closely with our customers in terms of understanding how they're operating within this kind of new world order, um, and doing the best that we can as a company to support their needs throughout their processes. And that's everything from helping them with an iterative learning plan, um, allowing for the ability to retarget and iterate with consumers along the way. It's a core tenant to Susie's value proposition as a, as a uh, platform. Um, and speed and agility, in addition to quality, is paramount today as you're conducting research, as you're developing new products and services and going to market with those products and services. And the reality is you gotta change a little bit of your mindset. So at Suzy, we kind of struggle a little bit with change management because a lot of folks are setting their ways and we're constantly pushing and adapting and trying to um, innovate within, a, um, uh, within an industry, within a uh, structure that has been set in the way they've been doing things for a long time. And we're proud to be able to pioneer that way forward. Because the reality is when we entered the market a few years ago, what we saw was a very fragmented experience. Um, we saw agency service providers really owning the better part of the market share um, and doing a great job with it. But as the world speeds up and as you as, as brands and companies need to keep up with the speed of culture, we like to say that at Susie, um, you need to kind of broaden out and service providers aren't as agile as they need to be in today's world of work. Um, then you have a number of tech platforms that allow you to do really interesting and unique things. Um, and those are typically powered by Panel solutions. So you've got a number of really great providers individually across the market. Um, and what we're trying to do is bring that all together. And we believe the white space for Susie is to help enterprises navigate this world order because agencies do a phenomenal job. And we know our brand partners love their agencies. Um, but at the same time, they need to bring certain capabilities in house. They need to be able to be efficient, they need to be able to be agile, they need to deploy their agencies. Um, with specific purpose. And we also believe that there are too many tools out there that do individual things. And what we're trying to do is bring all those things together in order to simplify, um, in order to accelerate the innovation in the market research landscape, 
and to level up the kind of data and the solutions that our product is delivering so that we're pulling it all together and simplifying the process. Because the reality is in today's sped up culture, you need iterative and connected research, and you need it across the entire organization. You need to enable your insights team so you understand what makes consumers tick. You need to enable your innovation team so that they're delivering products and innovating products and, and, and services that delight consumers and business models that resonate with them. Um, and you got to take those products to market and empower your creative teams to test creative, to test claims, to test packaging, to allow for all of that to be connected through the process, even once you're in market, so you're understanding how your competition is stacking up, how you're stacking up against your competition, and all of that needs to be connected throughout the entire organization. And what we're trying to do is change that paradigm. We are changing the way research gets done by pulling all of those disparate fragmented um, pieces and components and pulling it all into one connected research cloud. We're bringing the panel, the qual, and the quant all into one system with simplicity and ease in order to accelerate your ability to do all of those things that I just talked about across the entire landscape so that Susie can enable you to do quick turn research. Susie can enable you to conduct robust projects and everything in between. The way we do that is by connecting qual and quant in one singular system, allowing you to throw up individual questions, long form surveys, um, uh, product testing, focus groups, one-on-one -on -one in depth interviews, all within one connected platform, all powered by an audience that is integrated into the system, allowing you to target precisely, to retarget, to, uh, 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 to deliver results in unparalleled time, and do it with the highest order of quality. And quality is a big part of what we believe in, in terms of um, what we need to deliver to our customers. Um, the back end of our system is powered by screening, verification, fraud prevention, capture, and any number of these listed items that allow us to deliver fraud, uh, fraud rates below industry standards and unparalleled within the industry. The other thing that makes this really unique is our subscription-based pricing. Project POs, panel providers, all of those things go away when you work with us because we're simplifying it from end to end. The way you work with us is pretty simple. You can choose. We know every enterprise customer is uniquely different. Uh, so whether you want a self-guided DIY solution or you want everything to be handheld for you or anything in between, we have the model that resonates within the enterprise. Backed by people who have been industry leaders for decades. Um, these folks are building a center of excellence within our organization that allows for unparalleled quality and agency rigor that you come to expect. The SUSE Research Cloud is made up of three core products. SUSE Insights, allowing for basic and advanced survey design. SUSE Live for effortless live research, like one-on-one -on -one in depth interviews, multi-person focus groups, in-home product tests, and SUSE Audiences, which is our screen and verified uh, panel, allowing you to do US and global targeting, integrate your typing tools, target and retarget, and dynamic segmentation so that you have all the audience segments that you need at the touch of the platform. So a quick little bit of our history, which I, I wanted to share. We've been around now, coming up on almost five years, which is a really, um, it feels like an eternity, but at the same time, it's a blink of an eye. And three plus years of that was during a pandemic. So we've learned a lot over the years. And when we first started, um, we were a agile tool. Very simple, easy to use, launch some questions, get some answers, and do it in seconds. And over the years, what we've realized is that we need to grow up as an organization. The needs of our customers have grown up, especially in the wake of a pandemic, when insights has become paramount to day-to-day -day operations. And our progression has evolved. In the last couple of years, we've spun up our center of excellence. We've added more advanced action types. Um, we've allowed for more connected data. And as we evolve into what we're starting to call kind of SUSE 3.0 entering 2023, our vision is to build a connected system, the operating system for market research, allowing you to connect all different types of point solutions in one place, allowing for audiences to be built in, and allowing for more complex data streams to come out in order to deliver your business intelligence. 
With that, I'm going to give you just a quick sneak peek of some of the things we have coming uh, into the system over the next few months, between now and the end of the year. Um, I'll share a few little bits of the product. First, we're going to be launching a Data Explorer product. Now, Data Explorer it has been probably one of our most um, anticipated and uh, most in-demand uh, product offering, allowing for you to analyze multiple data sets, allowing you to uh, uh, create custom banners and, and cut up your data in infinite ways. And here's a quick click through of what the experience will look like in platform. Um, so like I said, you will be able to create customized reporting with custom calculations to do advanced analytics. Um, you can export those reports. You can visualize in platform with tables and charts and graphs, all at the click of a button. You let the little demo finish through so you can see how it all manifests. And there is all the results. The next thing we're going to be launching before the end of the year, we're going to start to build a path towards what we call advanced action types. Right? Uh, Max diff is also a highly in demand action type that our customers have been uh, asking for. And that allows you to do um, really force, force ranked uh, options. So Max diff allows you to quantify consumer preferences by forcing them to rank by their most and least preferred options. Um, you can add up to 30 attributes, you can target, you can retarget, um, you can review very quickly, launch in platform, you can launch it as a single action type, or you can embed it within a survey. Um, and at the push of a button, you'll be able to download your reports, download the PowerPoint, download the raw data, all again with the click of a button. Ready to launch. In comes the results, all in platform all your ranks, and within a couple of seconds, download your data, and up comes your PowerPoint. The next, this is probably my favorite, uh, the next offering that's coming to Suzy at a screen near you, uh, unmoderated qual. Uh, I mentioned this in our last um, web event, this is uh, our last virtual event, that this was coming by the end of the year. Uh, Video Open Ends allows you to launch instantly to hundreds of consumers and solicit video-based open-ended wall. Um, this is simple. Type in your question, upload your media within a few clicks, target your audiences, your segments, retarget who you need to, and in moments, you will have results at your fingertips very similar to our existing open-ended results, and quickly watch, clip, bookmark, and create reels of your video open-ended responses. And last, but certainly not least, as we start to get more and more complicated in our, um, uh, in our offering, uh, we want to make sure that you have the most up-to-date information and data on how to conduct best practices within our platform, within overall research methodologies. And so we are launching Suzy Academy uh, in order to, I'll show you what that looks like as well, uh, in order to help with market research fundamentals, advanced methodologies, understanding different use cases and best practices. Uh, for example, when we launch our MaxDiff offering, we will also launch a MaxDiff curriculum so that you'll have the ability to understand exactly how to use it um, for the best way possible. So we are going to continue to innovate over the next several quarters and ultimately definitely we have a pretty robust roadmap plan for next year. Um, it's pretty exciting that as we grow up as an organization, we've in fact got our 2023 roadmap. Um, I wouldn't say locked because things tend to change quite a bit, but we're getting ahead. We understand what the needs of our, consumer, of our customers are, and we're constantly taking feedback from you in order to push that back into our roadmap and push our innovation pipeline forward. Um, with that, I am going to stop talking, and I'm going to turn the floor over to Diane, who will talk to you about trends in innovation. Uh, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Diane Cheshire, and uh, 
My friends at Suzy asked me to talk about trends in product innovation, and I am delighted to talk about this. And um, was working for 30 years or more, um, just retired from Procter & Gamble, and um, was working across many categories, um, bath tissue, paper towels, hair care products, and, and my last um, assignment was in, in packaging for the whole entire company. I have some global experience as well. And I was always, always searching for the right tools and methods and metrics to know that when I was developing a product, it was actually going to be delightful for the consumers enough that they would want to repurchase it again. So, and um, I ran across Susie kind of near the end of my career because I think they were an answer to a prayer. Frankly, I could get, I could get in touch with consumers so fast. So. When I retired, um, you know, they asked me to join the advisory board, and I was delighted to do so because I really think the vision is exactly where we need to go. So I want to talk a little bit about a couple of the massive disruptive trends that are happening, happening in the world today. And, and I believe that everybody's going to, great, thank you, is going to be able to understand this because we're all consumers and we're all living through it right now. So um, what I'm going to cover are the two massive disruptors. So environmental social impact. Um, that is one that is maybe a little bit newer than, than the second one, which is, which is one I'm going to talk, uh, which is the massive digital disruption trend. So um, and, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the way we need tools to change in the industry to be able to deal with the fast innovation cycles that are happening because of all the disruption that's happening so darn fast in the, two, in the first two areas. All right, so envi environmental social impact. You might hear it called, be called ESG in the industry, in, environmental social governance. And um, what you know, we're learning is consumer expectations are rising for environmental social impact from um, companies. And they fully, fully expect the manufacturers to solve the issues with, with zero trade-offs. And in fact, they would desire to make the products even better, more easy, and more delightful to use while being good for me and good for the planet. And we all know in the economy today, money's tight. So um, they expect those, those products to perform equal or better and um, you know, no trade-offs at all. So it doesn't really matter where you stand politically. I'm going to share some data from, that's pretty much hot off the presses from the Suzy panel. Um, you can't ignore the fact that consumers really are um, raising the bar. And, it, and it's really, it's not just consumers, it is shareholders and it is employees. And um, if any of you are paying attention, um, back in the spring of 2021, there was, um, this is ExxonMobil, had an activist um, shareholder from the environmental industry, two activist shareholders kick off existing, not shareholders, kick off existing um, um, board members. And so they had, they had a massive shock in terms of how they needed to address their innovation plans to better be uh, meeting the needs of shareholders and um, consumers and their employees for um, doing a better job in environmental sustainability. And it's been a bit of a wake up call, I think, for, for um, any of the laggards that have not been thinking about that. I would say that most major companies in the um, consumer product space have been making very commitment, very very public and strong commitments to um, environmental and social goals you know, over the last several years. And, and you know, in fact, things like um, getting to zero emissions in a reasonable amount of time, um, reducing um, you know, carbon footprint, getting, getting, reducing the use of plastic materials and packaging, et cetera. So um, you know, it, there's a lot of, I would say, innovation happening in that space. And it's happening very fast. And companies that are trying to innovate in this space need tools and metrics to help them understand, are they moving in the right direction? Are they delighting consumers? And are they actually doing the things that matter? And I can tell you, and I've been to many trade shows in the last three to five years, and it is the number one topic of conversation is how do, how do we do our, the best job possible? We have money to invest. How do I make sure I'm putting it in the right places? So the data, and um, this is from the Suzy panel, um, 20, what we find is 20% of US consumers desire sustainable products and packages. 53% um, of those want personal care products to offer refill programs for packaging. And 68% are willing to swap their brands or products for more sustainable versions. And while that's only 20%, we expect that to grow. I think we were expecting that to be around 40% in the US by 2025. It maybe is going to slow down, maybe not go quite that fast. 
um, given, given sort of the distraction of COVID, et cetera, but it's double that number in Europe. So in France and Germany, that number is 40%. So it's, while, it's, while it's small, we can't ignore it, it's growing. And you're starting to see innovation show up in this space. And when you ask consumers, you know, give us your best in class example of products that you've used that are doing a good job with, with a great product while being end to end sustainable, Allbirds comes up pretty frequently in that conversation. It's always one that, that we would always study to say, what are they doing really, really well? And um, there's many other companies, and you'll, I don't know, I, 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 get, a, I get fed a lot of sustainable products on my Instagram feed. So um, ones that always, always show up, and I've tried um, are things like uh, Who Gives a Crap? They're trying to, to disrupt the toilet paper industry with a direct-to-home model. And, um, and Blue Lamb, which is, which is doing refillables with little tablets. I'm not sure they've kind of knocked it out of the park yet in terms of meeting expectations for delightful products, but you know, there's a lot, those are just a few examples. There's a lot of innovation in this space and I expect a lot more. Switching to um, fair trade and transparent sourcing. This is all about products that are, that are free from all of the nasty chemicals, things I can't pronounce and understand, just in general free from the bad stuff and full of the good stuff that I can understand and I know it's gonna be good for me. Um, that's become kind of a mainstream expectation of products. So there, I think this trend's a little bit more mature than the sustainability trend I was talking about before. And you're starting to see things like credentialing, like leaping bunnies showing up on products so that consumers know that they're, they're, you know, there's no animal testing happening and be, be corporations for companies who are doing a good job with um, environmental sustainability. So, so that's becoming more of a mainstream thing. The other thing that we're seeing a lot of are, are things like fair trade and, and, um, and sustainable supply chains. And this is even sometimes down to the farm where the, a particular you know, raw, raw material or ingredient was, was produced. And the example I have of that is a brand that was built um, on, on fair trade cocoa, and that's the farmers being paid a fair living wage. And um, that was built, I think, in, in Northern Europe, and it's, it's now available pretty much everywhere on their really delicious um, chocolate bar, so Tony's Chocolate Lonely. So it's becoming more and more of a, of a thing. And some data from Suzy that was kind of hot off the presses is 49%, um, so nearly half of consumers say they feel misled by beauty product labeling information even today. So even though there's been a ton of progress, there's still an opportunity to do better with 49%, not quite, needs not being met. So, and I expect that um, inclusion is gonna become even a bigger um, topic on, on top of these two going forward particularly with baby boomers kind of hitting the, the, um, you know, the need to have products that, that uh, meet their needs a little bit better. So things like having packaging that you can actually read in the shower, that I would love for that to be something that could be done. Um, you imagine as um, baby boomers age, age they're gonna have a hard time opening packages. We're gonna need things that are more accessible and for, and for those consumers who can't quite, um, who are underserved today by their products. That, that we're making. So I imagine that that's going to be a big force in the future. Okay, so switching gears to digital disruption. And I think I think you all are, you know, have experienced this. And in fact, if you haven't um, been doing a lot of digital shopping, I imagine you've, you've at least doubled or tripled your, your experience with that, you know, during, during COVID. So, um, and what we learned during COVID, and especially in expansion of digital commerce, I believe I, I heard a statistic that in the first year of the of the pandemic, the the e-commerce um, development was was ab about ten years of what had happened in the, over the previous ten years. So it 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 just exploded um, during COVID. And then we're also seeing a lot of things like digital and physical products merging. So, for example of that like Peloton, um, and we're also seeing sort of like little bits of the metaverse starting to become more of a normal thing, and that's, we think that's gonna be a big, uh, a big digital disruptor in the future. So let me talk a little bit more about that. I've got lots of great data from Susie on these. So with the effects of, of COVID, I talked about that. Oh yeah, so, the, so some data I wanted to start from Susie is, Almost two-thirds of consumers, so 64% of respondents, said they spend more time at home today than they did before the pandemic. So, um, so not out and about shopping the way they used to do um, and engaging with the world the way they used to do. So a lot more opportunity to, to shop with their phones, um, put on a 
metaverse headset and, 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 you know, and work with brands that way. So you probably have seen um, during, during the pandemic, both Walmart and Target announced some major investments so they could give, they could give Amazon a run for the money when it, when it comes to e-commerce. You see things like Etsy and Shopify being new ways to, for consumers and startups, frankly, to, to launch brands and consumers to try things that they couldn't you know, previously get their hands on. So almost today, you must have the world at your fingertips when you're shopping. And there's so many choices you know, compared to what there was just five years ago. So it's, an ex it's exciting and amazing time to be a consumer because the choice is amazing. We're going to talk about the merging of, um, of digital and physical. So 20% um, of all searches today are completed without a keyboard. So I'm assuming that's the uh, you know, ask Alexa or ask Siri um, you know, a question uh, to get a search started. And um, so, you know, so they're here to stay. Those, those, that way to search is voice is here to stay in terms of the way that consumers want to interact um, digitally. And the Internet of Things is now, I would say, pretty firmly established. And um, disruptions are happening pretty much everywhere. So I don't know about you, but I have apps for my, I have apps for my vacuum. I have apps for my doorbell. I have apps for, my, for watering my garden. And all of those things were incredibly necessary, and I love them all. But I'm starting to get a little bit of, a, of an app overload. And the other thing I'm getting a little bit worried about is, is um, having, having that data that I'm sharing um, over those apps available to, I don't, I don't know what, for what nefarious reason, but I think that that's a concern I personally have. And there's some data here I want to share. And I don't think I'm alone in that. So um, some, some Susie data is um, in, in the US, adult ownership of smart speakers and smartphones is at 55.6%. And that was 2020 data. And 30% of Google searches require no screen at all. So I'm assuming those are being done by voice. And um, one in every two search, searches will use visuals or images. So things like Pinterest lens, I'm assuming Google lens might be another way that consumers are doing that. Um, and as, as we saw in the slide, 20% of searches last year were, compete, were completed without the use of a keyboard. So voice is just becoming more of a disruptor. And some more data, over a third of consumers, 37%, are interested in converting their home into a, their home into a smart home. And 34% of consumers are interested in integrating smart security devices into their homes. So, you know, that's the, that's the security that I'm looking for. Hopefully someone can help me with that. Okay, so now we're gonna switch to the metaverse. So I got an Oculus headset um, at, about, at about this time last year. And um, I put it on, and within the first five minutes, I was watching a, a five-minute video clip of Jurassic Park. And literally, it felt, it felt like there was a velociraptor behind my back breathing down my back. And it was, it was so immersive, it was actually almost nerve-wracking, more, almost more than I could take. And I also, um, the next day, I was just, I was prepping to get ready to go to a meeting in the metaverse. And I um, was in a, an actually a meeting room. I had my avatar. I was a little bit disappointed in the clothing choices I had for my avatar, but um, but I was st I was standing next to one of my colleagues who I nor who normally work with, who's in Germany. Another one of my colleagues from New York City was sitting on my right, and I was you know talking to somebody from Chicago who was right there, and it felt like we were all in the same room. So within you know less than an hour of me being in the metaverse, fully immersed with a headset, like I could see that this that that people are going to want to consume content and they're, they're going to want to interact with brands and products in the future. And so not surprisingly, I have some data. Gen Z is the most interested in the metaverse. And 10% um, of Gen Z has said they've, it, they have attended an event in the metaverse. So I thought I was cool and being unique because I had been in an, on an, in an event in the metaverse, but 10% of people already in the metaverse. 9% of those people have um, have acquired an, an NFT, a non-fungible token. And I'm assuming that's something that they, they can do to maybe dress their avatar up and look a little cooler. And they expect those NFTs are going to increase in value over time. Some amazing ways we can think about you know, interacting with brands and products um, in the future. So I'm gonna share some more data. I won't read this to you, but 
you know, you can look at that 50% of consumers are looking to try and or buy products in a virtual setting. It's, pretty, it's a pretty high number. All the way down to 33% um, are looking to do a co-creation with a celebrity on an experience in the metaverse. And some hot off the press data, 22% um, of, of um, those consumers are interested in, in Rihanna, 21% in Lady Gaga, 17% um, in Snoop Dogg. And um, the brands that these consumers have heard about for advertising in the metaverse include 50% have heard of Facebook, 19% have heard of Coca-Cola, and 17% have heard of Microsoft. So I don't know. I, th that data makes me feel like it's probably a little closer than, than we think. And there are also some emerging cases where VR and AR is already almost just a regular way of doing business. And, and actually an important part of the product experience. So things like the Oculus Quest I was talking about earlier, that was the number one seller um, for Christmas um, 2022. And I imagine it'll be, a, it'll be important going forward. You want to get that for you, Avi? <laughs> <laughs> Ikea and Wayfair, you can, you can, I know you, you, many of you have probably tried this. You can use AR to, um, to shop for furniture and see what it looks like exactly in the room that you intend to put it in, sizing and everything. So it's pretty amazing. And then we've got the, um, the mirror that Lululemon recently acquired where you can actually have a workout in front of your mirror with a real person on the other end, or maybe it's a bot on the other end, but you're seeing all kinds of great stats and getting feedback along the way. So it's going to change our lives in ways that, that, um, that I think we're just going to have to learn about and wait and see what happens. So with all this change happening, it's an exciting time to be a consumer. Your brand experience and product experiences are way different than they ever have been. And it's a little bit frenetic. And the, the pace of change is really, really high. And if you're a researcher today looking for how in the world do I keep up with all this, old-fashioned survey tools that, that I grew up with where you have to study, maybe wait six months, get a handful of questions you get to ask, and you um, model it, use that data really well, break it by lots of segments, and then wait again for three to five years until a massive trend happens in the industry to, to repeat. The, those days are long behind us. We need very, very different tools. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what the needs are going forward. So. Researchers need to be able to form a hypothesis, you know, almost back to basic science 101, form a hypothesis, be able to come in in the morning, place that study, um, you know, A-B study, get the results overnight, tweak their hypothesis, change their product, and place it again. It needs to be that fast. It needs to be mobile. It needs to be inexpensive. You can never, ever, ever let go of the rigor and the agility um, that that we require to have in you know, any kind of data that we that we rely on. So the other thing it needs to be is, is it needs to be behaviorally science sound. So I was listening to one of the Suzy podcasts from earlier this summer, um, is one of the, the um, Speed of Culture podcasts. And the guest speaker said that Behavioral science really is in its golden age when it comes to market research, and she nailed it on the head. It's absolutely true. And the notion of current behavior is probably the most predictive of future behavior. That's one of the things I learned um, you know, from my behavioral science um, you know, partner at, at, at p and it's absolutely true. So being able to, to understand what that consumer is doing in the moment that, that they're doing it is really, 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 really important. We probably all have read Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow, and we know that the idea that consumers, for the most part, when they're using our products or assessing a product or browsing, are in system one thinking, right? It needs to be fast. It needs to be gut-based. It needs to be um, it, it needs to be super easy, and often that processing is going on below the perceptual level. Consumers don't even know, like, you know, why they're making a decision that they're making. Um, and if we force them to get in the system too and post-rationalize why they might have done something, we're probably not getting the right answer. So really, really, it's about catch them at the right time. And that's one of the things that's most exciting to me about the Suzy tools is you can just reach out to a consumer and, and get their feedback at any moment in time along a usage journey. The other thing that I learned um, that, that is really important when it comes to behavioral science and observational research 
It's this idea of the peak end rule. So the peak and the end. So any kind of experience where you're creating a memory, and hopefully that memory is good so that you want to repeat that experience over and over again. Um, they've done lots and lots of research. Um, behavioral science have done lots of, lots of research to show that the things that you remember most um, about an experience is the peak moment and the end moment. And the peak is hopefully good because you're probably not going to want to repeat it if it's not. And the end ought to be pretty darn good as well. And I can, I'm pretty sure that most people are paying attention to the peak, um, paying attention to the end, or maybe those things that may actually be negative peaks that would cause someone never to come back again. So I want to tell a little bit of an ex experience story I had. And you can kind of run through these yourselves when you think about some experiences you've recently had. So I was on a road trip with my family recently. And, when, and we were all in the car, big car, um, full of luggage. And we decided we wanted to stop and grab lunch. Um, and we wanted to grab chicken sandwiches um, because we're all, all kind of trying to understand who's our favorite chicken sandwich restaurant, right? So we found one of, the, one of the big chicken sandwich companies. And we stopped, got our chicken sandwiches, and they were delicious. Um, nice and crunchy, good amount of spice, good amount of pickles. I'm not going to name the company. Um, we, we, had a, we had a great time comparing that to our other recent you know, chicken purchases. But then, um, you know, a couple hours, fast forward a couple hours later, and I'm cleaning out the car after we got to our destination, and I had about five or six styrofoam cups that I had to throw away. Those are going to go into the landfill and be there a 1,000 years from now, long after I'm dead. Um, the, all the wrappers for the chicken sandwiches were these multi-layer foil paper wrappers. Again, those are going to be, you know, in the landfill or for a 1,000 years. And so... That last moment for me was terrible. And it's, it causes me to, to, to think I'm not going back again to that particular restaurant. I don't care how good the chicken sandwich is until they fix that problem. Because that I'm one of the 20% where that's really important to me. Sorry for that. Um, so, and I contrast that with the lunch I just had earlier today. I, I went to Sweet Green and um, it was, it was, Everything was 100% compostable, so I know it's going to go into the landfill, and if I had a compost, it would be gone really, really fast. So, and it was a delicious salad on top of it, so a good, a good peak and a good end. So, um, so we need to be able to catch, catch consumers in the act when things are happening that are really important to them. So having an ability to, to be always on and use your mobile phone to touch base with consumers, get that good qualitative data, is really important. The other thing researchers need is to feel like they're, the, re, the feedback is authentic. They're getting real ratings and reviews, nothing, nothing that's bot generated. And those insights are, are really strong, and we're taking advantage of, of natural language processing, can really see where the insights lie under the comments. And then lastly, we'd love to have research be anticipatory. So for years and years, Netflix has been doing a really good job of recommending to me um, you know, content that I, may, I, might, I might want to be interested in. Spotify does a great job for me. Um, I'm actually a little bit worried how well Instagram is doing at feeding content towards me. So I imagine like, we've got to be able to do the same thing in the, in the research world. There's so much interaction that consumers are doing with ratings and reviews, et cetera. We should be able to understand where the sentiment where the puck is going so that we can start we can start developing things maybe even before consumers think that they really need need them or want them. So that's the other the other thing I, I would anticipate is going to be in, important in the future is anticipatory research. So I think social listening will be more important than ever for um, industries, brands, um, et cetera. And with that, you know the world is a crazy place right now. Um, all this change it is exciting, and the and you know the world, um, the tools we need to, to stay in, and stay up to speed with this, with these much faster innovation cycles, completely changing. I believe Susie's on to something. I was delighted to see all the wonderful new new things that that were shared earlier. And I think with that, I turn it over to Katie for a Q and A panel. Hey. Well, hello, everybody. It's to see everybody face to face. We talked a little bit about the metaverse there, and I get a little bit upset because I actually miss humans and I miss hugs and uh, <laughs> as European, miss touching, etc. 
Um, I'm Katie Gross. I'm the Chief Customer Officer here at Suzy. And so I'm really excited to continue the conversation um, that Diane started there um, with two of my very special guests. Um, we have Amy from City and Ash from Mars Wrigley. And I will actually hand over to them to introduce themselves a little bit more about their role um, and we'll start in the conversation. So Ash, we'll start with you. Hi, I am Ari Skruman. I um, work for Mars Wrigley, makers of m and Snickers, Twix, Extra Gum, all of the amazing brands. And I have the great privilege of amplifying those brands in retail for the value channel, where over 25% of Americans shop for confectionery. And I really enjoy what I do. Um, previously, I managed the Caesar brand, which is the number one dog wet brand um, in the United States and globally, led our innovation management, more long-term, three years out innovation. I've been with Mars for roughly eight years now. I have an MBA from Darden, uh, undergrad from NYU. Excited to have you. Thank yeah, you. thank you. And Amy, we'd love you to introduce yourself to the audience. Absolutely. Hi, I'm Amy Heron, and I'm the head of insights and competitive intelligence at Citi, um, supporting all lines of business um, for the U.S. Consumer Bank. So that's our cards business, retail, mortgage, wealth. Um, and we do all sorts of primary research as well as um, push out and produce and analyze um, market trends for the business. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm excited to start diving in um, and have a discussion around some of the topics that Diane raised. Um, and one of those, the first one being environmental and social impact. She talked about a lot of changes around consumer um, sentiment towards sustainability and inclusivity. And I'd love to know how that's playing out at your brands um, and the discussions that you're having. And Amy, we'd love to start with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think City thinks about inclusivity in several different ways. Um, first, internally, we have a very, um, you know, focused, focused um, vision on how we hire, right? Um, I'm personally on a panel with senior leaders around, you know, retaining female talent in the financial services industry. So, um, you know, internally, I think we, we talk about it a lot and focus on how to be inclusive with our employees. And we know that's important to consumers, right? We saw that especially spike through COVID. People became very concerned not only about how they were, you know, interacting with the environment, but also how they're treating their employees. Um, so, the other way that that city is thinking about this is, you know, we're involved in an industry-wide um, coalition called Reach. I don't know if you guys are familiar. It's the Roundtable for Economic Action and Change um, that's looking at how to better serve underserved populations and get, you know, provide an on-ramp to financial services and access to credit. Um, and my team is also personally involved in uh, financial inclusion and racial equity um, initiatives within city. So again, trying to better understand those underserved populations. Um, so it's a big topic. And um, I think we're hoping that, of course, it signals that not only does the city care about that, you know, authentically, but also that it would invite, um, you know, a more close relationship with the brand. That's great. And Ash, how's that playing out at Mars Wrigley? Uh, in many different ways, as you can imagine, Mars is the third largest private company in the United States. It has confectionery, which is Mars Wrigley, but it also owns pet food. So number one in various categories within pet, dog, cat, uh, and it also has food. So it's a giant conglomerate that takes its responsibility very seriously. I've been at Mars for eight years now, and I continue to stay because of how seriously it takes that. Um, from an environmental standpoint, a lot of our products are single-use plastic. Right? So switching to how do you start to think about the role that Mars has in bettering what that looks like? Um, chocolate melts, unfortunately, and so the type of packaging that you use is very critical for the enjoyment for the consumer. So Mars has various work streams on experimenting with more sustainable packaging. Um, from an ingredient standpoint, what I was personally responsible for on Caesar was what do sustainable ingredients look like? And that is a harder question and a harder challenge, which made it a lot more fun. Um, because when you think about the scale that Mars has, the amount of ingredients that you pull essentially deplete the sustainable resources that you have. Right? So how do you balance what you want to create by leveraging the current resources as well as not depleting it for everyone else to use as well? Um, and then I think from a, from a third standpoint, 
right, the recyclability, right? So you have the packaging, you have the ingredients, and then you have the recyclability. In Europe, those uh, statistics that Diane presented are a lot higher because the infrastructure really exists to support uh, um, a lot of that recyclability as well. In the US, not so much. It's heavily um, decentralized. And so I think the one takeaway that I've had over the number of years working on this is that we don't need to recycle perfectly. We, everyone needs to recycle imperfectly in order to have an impact. Um, and that kind of messaging, trying to figure out how it resonates is important. Um, on the inclusivity side, switching gears for just a second, inclusivity is a behemoth to tackle. And you, the way to do it is you dissect it into smaller chunks. And you know, I'm a huge fan of the agile methodology and working in sprints. Um, and part of those sprints include your hiring practices, your retention. And you know, talking about retention, um, I was listening to the radio, which doesn't happen that frequently, <laughs> but being stuck in traffic, waiting for the UN traffic to pass, um, was that a lot of employers are laying off individuals now over the last couple of years, they've recruited heavily women and minorities, but those are really the first to go when you think about the new higher bias that exists. And so I think some, other, uh, some of the other sprints needs to be focused on how do you balance a bit of that. Um, it's not an easy question. It's not an easy answer either, but I come back to the same. Everyone needs to do it a little imperfectly in order to figure your way out. It's so important. I'm glad you say that because my three trash cans in my kitchen, I'm always trying to be perfect. I'm like, which one does it need to I, go I am too. We just started composting. We, we mm -hmm. actually pay for the privilege to compost. Mm -hmm. um, and only because I have a little child asking me why the apple is going in a garbage can. <laughs> yeah, I'll hit you up for tips later. Yeah. I'm not yet at the composting stage. Um, so Amy, you mentioned kind of authenticity and consumers are of course looking for authenticity from brands and I have to say being British that over the past week the number of brands who have tweeted about the Queen's passing um, in a very inauthentic way has been a little disappointing. I'm pretty sure she did not order takeaway pizza on a regular basis. <laughs> so it feels a little disingenuous. So how do you kind of avoid being inauthentic and how can you have a more transparent way of messaging? Yeah, um, in the financial services industry, being transparent is incredibly important, right? Because it's a kind of a gotcha um, situation sometimes where people are almost expecting um, to be hit with an unauthorized fee or, you know, for something to go wrong, right? Um, and we've seen fraud spike during COVID and consumers are very, very um, hyper aware of that right now. So as a brand, as a company kind of being um, incredibly upfront and authentic and making those T's and C's not mice type, right? But <laughs> putting front and center um, what's important to a consumer when they're making a decision about a financial product is something that we are always stressing with our partners and try to do in our research in terms of what are, what are people really trying to do here? What's really important to them? And showing them that, you know, and then letting them know that we know that we have these other things on the side that we are obligated to say as well. But, um, you know, we're, we're on your side. I think that's the message that consumers really want to hear from a bank is that, you know, we have your back and we understand. And um, that goes a long way in a yeah. relationship. Yeah, absolutely. And how's that playing out in Mars Wrigley with authenticity? Um, in, again, a number of different ways, because we are a little bit of a house of brands. I think when you think about authenticity, it really is the new brand standard. Okay? Everyone and everything just, it needs to seep into what you do, not something else you do. Mm -hmm. okay? and, and for me, I mean, when I think about brands that are authentic, I think a lot about social purpose brands, right? Like Patagonia, Skittles mm -hmm. with its pride, Pedigree with ending pet homelessness. Um, but at the same time, I also think of brands who can still be authentic without having a social purpose. And it comes down to three things, which I think a lot of the Mars Wrigley brands do really well. Excuse me. Um, one of them is this clear messaging, right? Patagonia is a good example. You, you know exactly what it stands for because it consistently reminds you of that. Um, and so clear messaging, I think, is one. Consistent messaging is a second. Patagonia does a bit of that as well, but Coke does too. Um, I think Coca-Cola, everyone who tried the new Coke hated it. And it's because they come <laughs> to expect this consistency of flavor from Coke. And if you screw around with that, you don't, Consumers aren't happy and it's not authentic anymore. And the third is consumer feedback. 
Right? And incorporating that um, into what your messaging looks like, right? And one example of that is Domino's. I mean, a couple of years ago, I think the consumer feedback was Domino's sucks, right? And the CEO took it upon himself to say, okay, we hear you, we're going to fix it. And, and I think that to me screams authenticity, mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily tied to a social purpose, but tied to who they are mm -hmm. and what is it they stand for. And I keep coming back to this. I think you can be a brand that doesn't do social purpose and still be authentic yeah. as long as you live into, you know, what is it that you're trying to do with your brand and tweeting about the queen. I, I did see that too. And I chuckled a little bit. <laughs> there was a few. Um, <laughs> it was there, the most few <laughs> There were a few, yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, so switching topics a little bit to, to the next topic that Diane mentioned, so digital transformation. Yeah. And of course, goes without saying that it's been on a huge upward trajectory mm -hmm. since uh, the start of COVID, um, and if not before, um, and particularly the expansion of digital um, commerce. So I'd love to hear examples of digital transformation at your company. Um, and Amy, we'll start with you again. Sure. Um, I think, Diane, you said that in e-commerce, it leapt forward 10 years, we like to say in financial services. It was five years, right? So um, city of course, has been spending a lot of time thinking about how to get our customers and others to bank more digitally on their mobile apps, et cetera. And we saw that um, for several reasons, right? Um, people had more time. They couldn't go to the bank branch. Um, you know, they were, as I mentioned earlier, like afraid of fraud, so checking things constantly. So a lot of that behavior, um, you know, accelerated tremendously. Um, and we think and I think know that it's, it's here to stay. Um, and of course, on the research front, right? Like everyone went totally remote, right? <laughs> we have, um, and and my, at, on my team, um, we never stopped researching. So from the moment that you know we all went home, it was like, okay, well, we're just going to do this remotely because it was very clear that we needed to provide an understanding back to our business partners about what consumers were scared about, um, you know, what expectations did they have from their financial services company, from their credit card, from their bank account, et cetera. So. Um, being able to do that quickly was really critical in that in that time frame, and um, we're still doing it. Although I'm a big proponent for back in the field as well. <laughs> <laughs> well I was going to ask, which of those kind of consumer digital kind of ad adopted behaviors do you think are here to stay? So I think things like um, you know we saw a lot more app downloads, et cetera, mm -hmm. for banking. You know, increasingly you know depositing a check via your mobile phone. Um, you know, moving to online bill pay, not stopping in the branch, et cetera. Um, but I think it's, some things are, uh, we might be going here, but I, mm -hmm. I also think some things are going to bounce back and have already started to bounce back. That's my next question. So. What's bouncing back, do you think? <laughs> or so. what's going on? Yeah. Hugs, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, hugs. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you know, I think that when it comes to the human touch, right? Like, and even this is outside of financial services, right? Sometimes you just have to sit on the sofa before you buy it, right? Like there are certain things that you want that physical interaction with. Um, and what we see is, you know, things that are, you know, highly emotive, right? Let's say you have fraud on your account or, you know, like you want to talk to somebody, right? You want that bot's not going to cut it. Um, you know, or you're buying a house and you want to talk to a mortgage broker or you want to talk to your investment advisor about something. Um, so we did see and you guys, I'm sure, you know, are well aware of, you know, like Robinhood and all those like self-directed investment platforms, et cetera, that grew by 700%, you know, over a certain period of time. But um, it still keeps coming back to, I think, probably what will evolve into more of a hybrid situation where um, you, you have a little bit of both. There's a lot of, of self-directed and, you know, that freedom that digital brings that people are really embracing, but also in certain moments, um, a person and that human interaction remains really important. Yeah, sure. Um, and over to Mars Wrigley, kind of what digital transformation is here to stay and which ones do you think are going to revert back? I mean, I think everyone hopefully will continue to want chocolate. It is <laughs> <laughs> all day, every day. Right? <laughs> like, it's a question of, you know, what does that last mile delivery really look like for everyone? Mm -hmm. And some of the challenges that we've had even before um, the pandemic was how do you do that when chocolate melts during these key summer months? And now global warming, summer is staying around longer and longer. And a lot of our um, retailers don't have a frozen supply chain end to end. Right? So some of those challenges that feel non-digital have some very digital solutions. I will say that we've been 
we've been digitizing before we've been transforming. And I think a lot of companies digitize before they transform. Putting yourself on a website and on Amazon is digitizing. Being across all of these channels is, is digitizing. Now, when you think about digital transformation, it is about what is changing about the consumer. And, and one of those is this cookie-less world, right? When you think about zero-party data and big brands aren't really at the forefront of that because we go through another retailer to get a lot of that data. And, and I think what's changing at Mars Wrigley and across, I would say, CPG is embracing data. And it's such a, I, makes it, I make it sound like this monolithic being, but it is this disconnected, disparate, contradictory, um, full of holes data. And the transformation piece comes from connecting the dots across all of these functions that have variously, at various points of the journey, sat on those data points. And the transformation, I think, is just beginning. Um, and what comes out of it, I'm really excited. Yeah. I actually have a really fun story you reminded me of there. A friend of mine came from the UK with her four-year-old son um, to visit last month. Um, she, there's lots of flavors of M&Ms she wanted to try, in fact. So she ordered them on Amazon. We went to Sesame Street for the day. They got delivered very early in the morning. We got back at 6 p.m. The box oh, no. was just full of melted chocolate. Yeah. Because, yeah, the, it was uh, that digital transformation, that digital behavior was not right for the, for the products that particular day, mm. for sure. Right. <laughs> So moving on to another topic, the metaverse, um, and continuing on to, to that mm. kind of area, which almost half of Americans actually feel they know nothing about. And unfortunately, I definitely feel like I'm part of that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so in fact, two thirds of Americans um, aged 13 to 56 have actually visited metaverse-like environments in the past year. So although we may feel we don't know enough about it, we actually are still um, taking part. Um, and one of the reports I read recently stated that 80% of consumers are definitely open to brands being involved in building the metaverse. Um, and they talked about the consumer desire for providing a virtual world of digital goods um, because ultimately consumers want to really try something in the metaverse before buying. And I really love this phrase um, that one of the lines was, I want to feel before I do, I want to be before I buy. Um, so would love to know kind of what your perspective is and what the kind of chat is over at City, Amy. So we'll start oh, sure. with you. Um, well, it's, I, I think it's hard to be a traditional financial institution and think of the role you could play or really should play in the metaverse, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's not something that we're that's occupying our every day yet, but um, mm -hmm. we're certainly starting to see movement in that space, right? So you can go into J.P. Morgan Chase's Onyx Lounge, right? You can see a picture of Jamie Dimon and a roaming tiger and consume their their thought leadership content, right? So that's one thing that we're seeing. Amex has done events in there um, with Wimbledon. They created their own Wimblecoin. Um, you know, so they're they're creating experiences. Um, Visa, I think, has a, a creators program where they're helping people understand how to integrate NFTs into their ways of commerce. Um, so there's definitely movement in the space, and I think it's probably going to take one of two paths, right? So the one is what I just mentioned about kind of bringing the humanity back um, into banking. So, you know, if you can imagine, I think the example was given, you know, you're sitting next to your colleagues in the, in the virtual space. Well, why couldn't you be sitting across from your advisor mm -hmm. at your kitchen table, right? But you're using your Oculus. Um, you could have a virtual bank branch, you know, there, you could, you know, Imagine kind of looking at all of your various accounts and, you know, becoming Tom Cruise in the Minority Report, right? Like, um, so I think there's lots of interesting ways to think about that experience. But then the other obvious one, right, is, is how do you get into the payments flow? Um, and so could we be creating bridges between, you know, digital currencies and currency that you use in the physical world? And who's going to own that space? And how are you going to get in the middle of that? Um, I think is going to be very interesting to see how that develops. Yeah. The Minority Report is one of my favorite movies and I definitely <laughs> watch it every couple of months and like, that's going to happen. That's already it's, happened. It's going to happen. <laughs> and so on. Happen. But with the product like chocolate and confectionery, you need to be able to taste it. So I'd love to know kind of what your thoughts are, Ash. I've got a lot of thoughts about the metaverse. <laughs> um, I, I think the convergence of technology, we can talk about metaverse, but it's also important to talk about the technology that's making up the metaverse. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, AI, VR, blockchain. And, and for me, I think there are a lot of questions around these three or more technologies 
that have, haven't been solved yet, right? The mm -hmm. metaverse is one of the newer frontiers and it raises a lot of ethical questions as well, right? So uh, even within blockchain, different schools of opinion, but the amount of resources that it consumes yeah. uh, and we can't separate it out from the sustainability conversation um, with VR and AI, the privacy concerns that come up, right? So keeping all of those in mind, I am still hopeful that what we can do in the metaverse is an amplification of the human experience mm -hmm. without taking away the humanity of it, um, where when you, when you then pivot to inclusivity and accessibility, I think VR um, or metaverse opens up a portal to embrace sort of all of these differences that exist as well. From a chocolate standpoint, um, Mars Wrigley hasn't made any public statements around our engagement in the metaverse, but we are engaging with the components of the metaverse, right? Uh, we have a partnership out right now with Kingship, right? So Bored Apes, and you can go buy a lot mm -hmm. of the M&Ms out there if you're looking, um, and, and just engaging and experiencing. And I think for all of the brands um, looking to engage with the metaverse, step one is really uh, a combination of insight. What are you trying to get out of it? Step two is this foresight. Where is it going? Uh, and make sure that you're plugged in, right? We talk a lot about disruption and I don't think disruption is, you know, something that someone does to you. It is something that you let happen to yourself because you mm -hmm. didn't uh, continue with the value proposition that's changing for the consumer. Um, the consumer is contradictory. The consumer is confused and inundated with all of these societal pressures right now. And I think as that starts to play out, um, some of the challenges with technology start to play out, I think the metaverse might be exciting. Um, but given, and I know this is like a doomy, gloomy message, but given the mental health challenges that are arising from lack of social content, I'm I'm a bit apprehensive of um, of what brands should be doing in the metaverse as well. And coming back to that authenticity, right? Does it does it make sense for your brand? Um, but eventually, I mean, you know, some of us in the audience are digital natives, and it I'm, my child will probably be a native of the metaverse. And what does that mean for her? Mm -hmm. I think it's my responsibility to make sure that I'm speaking up against some of those challenges that exist with it as well. Yeah, I'm so glad you say that because I have watched Westworld. So I, I agree not. with you. <laughs> <laughs> so how- More hugs. Yeah. Exactly, more hugs. <laughs> yeah. um, so how do we ease consumers and my own <laughs> um, concerns around the metaverse? Yeah, I think it comes back to those individual technology pieces, right? As we're starting to understand, I mean, some of them are so new, right? I still call it the frontier because we don't know a lot, right? There's so many unknowns out there about the metaverse um, from a consumer lens. Right? Mm -hmm. I am sure the individuals who are heavily involved in it are like, we know a lot more, Arsh, like, duh. Um, but I think from a consumer standpoint, uh, as the technologies start to develop further, right? Blockchain is still, I would say, very new, mm -hmm. even though it's made great strides in a lot of industries such as supply chain and financial services and uh, it it has potential that we have not yet tapped and mm -hmm. as we start to tap into that potential around what does it mean to have sort of this locked identity on on blockchain i think it will we will start to uncover a lot of privacy concerns and i think individuals are st i'm starting to ask about privacy right i mean it is simply clicking allow cookies isn't a go around around privacy concerns. It is something, but it is mm -hmm. not, it doesn't fully address it, I think. And, and privacy comes in many different forms. And I think mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. I gravitate towards that and the responsibility that companies have as well, right? And I get really pissed when someone shares my email because it takes a lot for me to share that now. But yeah. then there are others who are like, yeah, I don't care. They can have my information. And it's that balance of how do you make sure you're tapping into a little bit of everything, but also the responsibility that you have in order to make sure the person who doesn't care about sharing their information is still mm -hmm. protected. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and 
Amy, for you in kind of the financial services industry, how do we start to ease those consumers' concerns? And is blockchain one of the answers of, of holding privacy? Maybe. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that's another topic where people don't know a lot mm -hmm. about it today, right? Um, but I, I agree with Arsh. I think I was looking at some data from Morning Consult and the top two concerns are, number one was um, data privacy, right? Um, when people are thinking about Web 3.0 and the metaverse. Um, and the second one was, you know, um, kind of like mistreating each other in that environment, right? Like that bullying aspect. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, like very fundamentally, I think at this nascent stage, you know, companies are really responsible for helping to educate and bring people along in terms of how they're mitigating those risks um, and make people feel comfortable that if they're in that space, that that's a, you know, that's a safe place to be um, and they don't have to worry about their data being yeah. breached or what, or if it is, what, what are they gonna do about it? <laughs> yeah. All right, well, let's take a step out of the metaverse and back into an area that I'm far more comfortable, <laughs> research tools. Um, so Diane had kind of mentioned innovation cycles are shrinking and of course the need for mobile for research to be mobile, fast, inexpensive. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna ask a, probably a silly question. Do you agree with that, Amy? I do, I do. Um, but I was really glad to hear you know, both Avi and Diane say, and I think we all agree that the quality cannot go away, right? Um, it's kind of a big joke in my team, like if you say the words quick and dirty, like you're in big trouble. Um, like we don't do quick and dirty research. Um, and everyone knows that that's my pet peeve. So I like to, I like to rebrand it as quality at speed. Mm -hmm. um, we can do things fast, but you're gonna get the same level of rigor and, and quality because that I think is what, you know, we deserve to give yeah. to, the, to the business so we can enable better decisions, so. I agree, yeah, and I think, you know, Quality is an absolute fundamental, yeah. but I'd love to kind of hear from you, um, if that's a baseline, what are the other key features you're looking for in a kind of a modern research tool, Ash? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think a modern research tool needs to be easily understood and digestible. Mm -hmm. I think quality is obviously like table stakes. It mm -hmm. cannot be compromised, but when you start coming out of that and you're like, well, what else? I think it needs to be digestible and and shareable in a way that everyone mm -hmm. really understands, right? A lot mm -hmm. of individuals that I work with um, have had massive amounts of experience with some of the older tools that exist. And uh, the understanding of those tools is much higher. And so being able to utilize a, a modern research tool, I think for me makes my job easier to go to said individuals and say, these are the insights and these are the actions that I'm gonna take from those mm -hmm. insights. and and they sign off on it. I think that is what makes it modern to me is the closing that gap that exists between some of the doers um, and some of the higher ups. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. How can we encourage people to be kind of more creative with consumer insights, Amy? Yeah, I think it's, um, I, I think it's a lot of selling and advocating and, you know, like helping people to your point, understand the benefits of, of the insights and really kind of bringing it back to the core question that you're trying to answer and why you're trying to answer that question and what decision that answer is going to drive, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the more you kind of torture that, um, the more you kind of like look at the question in different ways that leads to more creative ways of doing actual research. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you don't need to ask the question at all, right? So we're doing a lot more um, social listening um, and online analytics and AI and text analytics, et cetera, that have brought us to different places, you know, and raised new questions that we hadn't really considered before. So um, we're doing that more and more in terms of, you know, triangulating different types of, of methods um, to try to keep ourselves, you know, asking the question a little bit differently. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Avi, of course, mentions that, you know, the industry was fairly fragmented when Susie first came mm -hmm. out, and we've been trying to bring that into yeah. to one place. So with that topic of mixing qual and quant, how are you kind of viewing that um, at, at Mars Wrigley, for example, and bringing those two together much closer? Yeah, I think we've gone from this idea that research, various types of research would help connect the dots mm -hmm. to now we understand a very holistic picture Right? And we're not simply trying to connect the dots. Okay, step one is we need to do mm -hmm. qual so we can figure out what our quant questions should really mm -hmm. be. And then from quant, it's like, okay, well now I need to go back and ask a lot of these open-ended questions. And instead of it being like this like point system, it is now you can combine them and mm -hmm. unleash the force of the holistic consumer 
Mm -hmm. um, who at one point in time might say, you know, if you're doing a Likert scale is, is picking something, but then when you start to ask open-ended questions, you're, you're like, wait a minute, this is a little contradictory. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's the power that some of the research tools really have is, um, is to really be a little bit more holistic in that and, and to take chances as well. I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, the previous question around creativity, I mean, I don't think of myself as a creative person, but at the same time, I think there's a safety in being able to uh, ask some of those questions because, you know, you get so many of them and you can ask them re relatively quickly as well mm -hmm. on Susie, mm -hmm. right? And it's not mm -hmm. like, oh, I need to pay for one question on an omnibus. And if that's not the right question, then I'm kind of, I've missed the boat on being able to ask the right question. And I think that that safety comes back to both being able to qu combine quant and qual as well. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. And you mentioned our favorite word, unleashed, there. So. Oh, yes. <laughs> I mean, the theme of the day. <laughs> For sure. Well done. And would you agree with that, Amy, kind of that mix of call and quantum? I do, play? yeah. that's mm -hmm. we, we tend to do most of our work that way now, I think, um, because a one-sided answer to the question is never enough, right? So if, if you have some anecdotes, people will say, well, oh, that's only 12 people. Or if you have, you know, or if you have, um, you know, a pattern that you're seeing in, in quantitative data, let's say, well, but what do people really think? Like, what do they mean, right? So you have to have both, I think, to tell the real story um, and to really bring forth, you know, the, the human nature of, of and contradictory nature of people, you know, especially when they're thinking about, I'm sure chocolate, but specifically their money, right? Like, um, it's a very fraught relationship that we're constantly mm -hmm. trying to unwind and you really need to, you know, like I said, like attack it from several different ways and being able to do that in the same deliverable is, is everything really. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You started talking about a couple of new methodologies um, recently there, but what do you think the next big transformation is going to be in the insights industry? Mm, that's a good one. Um, oh, good. Start with Marsh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, Amy and I were talking about this a little yeah. bit because uh, I was telling her what I was thinking and she was like, I agree with that. And I was like, great. Um, <laughs> so two people on this stage agree with it, which is I think the next transformation, I mean, of course, there are going to be tools and they're going to get awesome because Susie is behind it. Uh, but I think it's this democratization of insights. Mm -hmm. I am no longer in marketing. I am purely in sales right now. And my job is to amplify the brand in retail, if you think about the funnel, the closer I get to the buying, um, you know, putting the money on the table. And something that I'm super passionate about is unshackling these insights and, and making sure that it's not just marketing uh, who owns them, but they make, it, make their way through the enterprise and so that everyone feels empowered and starts to understand well, this is the consumer and the consumer can change. And how do you make sure, you know, you are changing with the consumer? And, you know, if, if I can get one less person to cringe when I say to statistical significance, I think that <laughs> that will be a transformation, you know? Yeah. Research unshackled with the topic. Re yeah. yeah. Right. Name of our next one. Yes, yes. For sure. I love it. Amy, is there anything that you would hope that the industry would kind of change in the next couple of years? Yeah, I think I think along those lines, I think we need to get a lot more um, comfortable with sharing the insights that that we generate and um, being pretty forceful about mm -hmm. you know driving those insights into the business to make sure that they're used right. Um, and part of that is is just having you know platforms where everyone can have you know develop a common understanding of what those insights are um, and and how to use them. Um, and also, I would love to not be known as like market researchers, right? Like, I feel like we should be known as like, you know, uh, decision- Data explorers. Data explorers, <laughs> but like decision intelligence, right? Like, like we're, we're a place to come where you need to, you need some aid in your judgment to make a decision, right? Um, and the way that we provide that is through data and consumer insight and human insight. Um, and we work a lot um, in trying to do even more with our analytics team at City to try to help, you know, again, like shine a light on, well, People are behaving a certain way, but then they're saying that they're doing other things. And how can we kind of start to be able to predict based upon what people are saying now that may affect their their how they're spending on their credit cards, how they're traveling, how they're whatever, you know, down the line. So we can kind of close that gap and help the business anticipate, um, you know, frankly, like bottom line <laughs> questions better. So I'm hoping that's We call them uh, the human intelligence team at Mars. Oh. Love that. <laughs> bring that humanity back. That's yeah. right. 
So with a lot of uh, researchers, insights folks, marketers in our audience, do you have any final piece of advice before we wrap up? Gosh. Well, as I mentioned, I'm in sales now. Um, <laughs> and so if you were sitting in front of me on the Mars side, I would say, please share your insights. Please be very forward thinking about what is it that you're asking and, and share it. If you think you've already shared it, share it again. Uh, mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. I, I, I would I'd be on the receiving end of it and I would welcome it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amy, any final thoughts? I agree. I just say, you know, don't be shy. Um, share what you know, I think, and try to link it to a, an action. And that's, that's the best way, I think, to get people coming back for more. And also, you know, have fun and, like, try to make it, you know, let's not take research so seriously sometimes. <laughs> it can be it's fun, too. Yeah, it is right. significant, yes. Is. Yeah. Maybe don't start with it's statistically significant. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Bring that in after. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much. This has been an absolute you. pleasure for both of you. I'm going to hand back to Avi, who's going to wrap us up for the day. Thank you. thank you so much for joining us today. On behalf of everyone here at Suzy, we are grateful for your ongoing support and that you chose to spend your time with us. We would not be here without you. Before I turn things over to our live Q&A, I also want to give one last shout out to our incredible speakers, Diane, Amy, Arsh, and Katie. We hope you stick around for our live Q&A session with leaders from our Center of Excellence team coming up right now. <laughs>